The Wind Cries Mary from the Jimi Hendrix Experience, and with me now is Mitch Mitchell. Welcome to the programme, Mitch. Hello, Annie. How are you? I'm fine. That, and obviously you were on that track. This is very true. Yes, play, playing the drums. And, and the reason you're here is that you've written a book called Hendrix Experience to commemorate Jimi Hendrix, who died 20 years ago on the 18th of September. Correct. Today I remember very well. Um, and also, if, if um, I'm sure there may be people who want to ask you questions about the band, about Jimmy, so if you do, the number to ring is 0712242000. M- Mitch, what kind of guy was he to you? Very difficult for me to describe. I mean, the person was a friend of mine. Um, yeah, a very sort of like a Clark Kent character in some ways, a mild-mannered reporter type, you know. Um, always a gentleman, a lot of fun to be with. I mean, people trying to make out he's some kind of morose character which i never found um you know i mean he made a lot of people smile and that's why maybe why a lot of the ladies really liked him you know oh yes I it was a, there was a fun side to this person yeah. you know he was actually I, I met him once and he was he was just incredibly polite and yeah. he was as you said a real gentleman if you both spoke together he'd say no you carry on you know and little little touches like that which were very endearing i must say um what do you feel about the, f- the fact that lately there seems to have been a great revival of interest in Jimi Hendrix w- with some of the new bands, like you can hear I- uh, Hendrix influences in bands like Stone Roses and whatever. H- how do you feel about that? Well, why not? I mean, you know, we all have to get our influences from whoever we yeah. can, you oh, know? I thought, quite, <laughs> I thought you were quite pleased about that. I, I think Hendrix would be quite flattered, but it's the same thing as so many uh, young players have taken up playing the guitar, you know, through maybe hearing Hendrix or... Let's face it, there's a lot of great young players out there, mm. you know. So I'm sure he'd be delighted. Yeah. Why did you write the book? What did you want to say? Basically, it was to put some of the records straight. I mean, A, I, I, I've never really wanted to uh, do a book. Until last year, I was living over in Ireland for a few months, and uh, I've, gone, I've got a lot of pictures that have never been published. And I thought, well, maybe mm, just put those out with a few captions. And... Over the past 20 years, people have come to me about twice a year and said, uh, hey, fancy doing a book? No, thank mm. you. Did you feel it you just felt the time was right. Yeah, did you feel that you didn't want to do a book because it would be like sort of cashing in? I did want to do a kiss and tell book mm. for a start. Last year, when I started to do the, um, put the photographs together, I suddenly realised there were, most people that have written books so far, A, didn't know Hendrix, mm. so they could write anything they like about mm. the person, mm. um, they just didn't know the person. They were, they were never around. I suddenly realised I was there. You know, I mean, I worked with the person for like, you know, four years. Um, so, hey, why not? You Let's should, try to put some of the records straight. Yeah, I've gathered there's a couple of other books coming out on his anniversary as well. Doesn't surprise me. <laughs> yeah, have you seen, have you read them yet? Do you know no, as yet I haven't. Well, well I guess they're, they're probably not, not actually published. How did you meet him? Uh, I was working in, in a band in England with Georgie Fame and the Blue Flames. And... Uh, I went to collect my wages on a Monday to be told that we were all fired. So I I went back home to my parents in Ealing and uh, there was a phone call from Chas Charla saying, I've got this guy, just come over from America. Um, Do you fancy having a play? Yeah. So I said, well, you know, sure, but, you know, what does it entail? What kind of work have we got? He's gone, well, there's two weeks with uh, Johnny Halliday. He's like the the Elvis Presley of France. And that was it. What, you backing know? him? So him? No, 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 no. Just supporting Johnny oh, supporting. Halliday. Opening the opening act for Johnny Halliday, yeah. you know. Um, so Johnny Halliday. Johnny Halliday. I think yeah. he's still going, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> very, very strong, yeah. you know. I mean, fierce act. Right, so, I mean, what, what was your initial impression? Well, Jimmy? Hend- yeah. Um, went down to a little basement club in Soho, and there's a guy in like a Burberry raincoat very wild hair but a very like quiet man has gone up you know do you know this Chuck Berry number do you know for the Sam and David or Wilson Pickett I mean we, we just spent the afternoon going through the numbers the lowest common denominator who knows what yeah until I said uh, well you know do, do you know any sort of Curtis Mayfield the impressions and the guy went straight into that guitar style of Curtis Mayfield which I've gone ah oh, you know the, this guy has done his homework mm. um it turned out that, that Hendrix had been auditioning drummers for about two weeks prior to our meeting, and that surprised me. I hadn't got any clue about this, you know. And in a small place like London, is well was in those days. Most of my friends had gone for the gig. Really? No one said a word, you know. <laughs> what? Because so, they hadn't got it. <laughs> yeah, well, who, no one knew at that time, yeah. you know. Mm. It was just like go along, have a play. That's it. Yeah. Did you? Were you immediately struck by his t- tremendous talent? Oh, tremendous talent. Yeah, no, really? no, no, quite honestly, the guy, I knew the guy was a, a phenomenal guitarist, but I didn't know 
what went with the guitar playing, like this, this, uh, this alter ego. I mean, when we did our first gig in, in France, you know, with Johnny Halliday, Johnny Halliday, um, suddenly, like, you know, there's this guy playing guitar, like, behind his head, between, you know, with his teeth and... I mean, something we hadn't seen at rehearsal, so that was, you know... Oh, so he sort of, he came to life on stage, yes? You, yeah, you got it. Yeah, and uh, so that was a big surprise. And, I mean, did you think, wow, this guy's got the most extraordinary talent and uh, you know, we're going to go a long way or, or not? Did you think we're just going to be a support band forever or what? No, no, there was a feeling that it was going to be... Uh, there was a feeling it could really take off. I mean, for me, it was like being released from prison really so I worked the band I worked with before have been a, you know a, gr a good band but a very structured sort of eight piece unit so to go to a three piece for me I could play whatever I wanted to mm. you know was he sort of, was he the leader of the band Did he, so he didn't tell you what to play no not at all uh, I mean you know he had ideas for you know maybe the way things should go no I had complete freedom and that was like the first time in, in my career so as a yeah. player so what, what what so your first gig in France so what what date was that? Or not exactly oh, what good date? Point. We're talking what, of, which uh, year? So we can put it in perspective. Pers perspective. Okay, it's 66. Uh, da, 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 early October, 66. I mean, the band was more or less formed at the end of September. We did two weeks rehearsal, basically. And um, that was it, straight out on, yeah. on this Johnny Halliday thing. And then when did you first make a record then? Uh, oh, about uh, in, in the first month. So More was that less. because Chaz Chandler got you a deal pretty quick? And no, no, no. Chaz put up everything he owned at that point. I mean, Chaz brought Hendrix over from America, right, mm. after seeing him in little clubs in Greenwich Village. And, uh, I mean, Chaz was hocking his own bases from the Animals days just to pay for the recording sessions. We hadn't got anything, you know. I mean, no gigs, nothing. Yeah. You know, outside the Johnny Halliday, two weeks working, you know, in France, no that gigs. Yeah, no record deal, nothing. Right. <laughs> So Chaz put all the money up. Yep. Then, and then what happened? Good point. Well, we went to the uh, little little studio in Kingsway in London, um, and cut Hey Joe. Mm. Um, we spent all of about I don't know three hours there, really sort of putting it down. Yeah. You know, a few backing singers. The Ladybirds came in. A few ooh's and ours. Um, mm. You know, okay, let's try to uh, shop the record. Yeah. You know? So the record was released, and what happened then? We were lucky it took off. Yeah. You know, we, we, we Chaz got a deal. I mean, we were doing clubs around the London circuit, the R&B circuit that I've done before, like with John Mayle and we did the Ricky Tick Hounslow and, you know, the usual stuff, you know. Um, a few showcase gigs like Scotch St. James, those kind of clubs where bands would go. And, and Beatles used to go there. So, well, yeah, and they were a great help. I mean, a lot of things happened with our band because it was word of mouth. Yeah. And... Uh, you know, they come and see our gigs, the Stones would come and see our gigs, and, uh, yeah, they put the word out, like, go and check out this band. So it's thank you very like much. It's a bit like that now, actually. It's weird. Yeah. It's, it really is a bit like that now. This is the River City People. <laughs> Highway child, Jimi Hendrix. I'm sorry to say it was River City People. <laughs> it was what was, had been put on the deck earlier, just to explain that misunderstanding. Anyway, my guest is Mitch Mitchell from the Jimi Hendrix Experience, and I thought we might actually have some people want to speak to you. Uh, Mitch, we're happy to do that. So, uh, if, and if you want to talk to Mitch about Jimi Hendrix or about Mitch Mitchell, give us a call on 71 2000 That's 71 2000 Right now we have Hal from Camberwell on the line. Hello, Hal. Hello. Hello, what would you like to say? Yes, well, uh, a lot of my friends um, think that Electric Ladyland is Hendrix's best album. But um, I have an album, which I think is almost as good, which is totally different, called Nine to the Universe, which I bought about eight years ago. And I see that Mitchell played on most of the tracks, except for the one actually called Nine to the Universe. And I was wondering what Mitch thinks of that album. Right, far away, Mitch. What okay. do you think of the album? How? I haven't listened to the album for a long, long time. Um, yeah, you know, as long as... Yeah, let the public decide. If they like it, fine. It's not as if you're holding back a bit here. Really? What's mm. that? Yeah, well, I mean... Do, I, I, do, don't know, I don't know the tracks that well. Well, it's, it's, it's a very jazzy album, and yeah. I know that you were influenced a bit by jazz. That some of your drumming um, wasn't always um, from rock. It was, you know, swirled around a lot, and uh -huh. it, you, it sounded like you had a lot of influences, that, that, a very wide uh, <laughs> influences. 
we don't we all you know we do the best we can here you know yeah. i think he's just being modest hal don't you yes yeah, is it actually who's, who's playing drums on the track that uh on 90 well, to the universe Miles, you know, Miles, why not you know good drummer the thing you know? is that, that i've often wondered about is why why did hendrix um get so worried about the, the like the blacks in harlem who felt that he was betraying blacks pe black people and were you sorry that you didn't get to play with band of gypsies when they, they were playing did, did you miss working with them in the later days um to answer okay i always worked with hendrix even when the band of gypsies was was being recorded i mean we're talking politic yeah. you know that's why the band of gypsies album had to be done I mean, Jimmy would always go and play with as many musicians as possible, as I would, when the Banner Gypsies was being recorded with Bunny Miles and Billy Cox. Um, I was out on the road with Jack Bruce and Larry Curiel, but Jimmy and I were still recording at that time. So there was no animosity about that, you know? Um, I think that's great um, that there wasn't any animosity. I often wondered about that. Oh, good. Well, I, I knew that. See, Mitch, I knew people would be asked. What I want to ask you long, burning questions ah. about the past. Well, I'm glad. I'm very glad, Hal, that we've sorted that one out. Thank yeah. you for your call. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye, Hal. Now we've got Gary and Hammersmith. Hello, Gary. Ooh, you sound a bit loud here. Gary, are you there? All right. Let's try and go to John in Marland. Hello, John. Hello, John. Are you there? Well, we've, we'll come back to him in a minute. We're going to actually play um, a, a track that means perhaps a lot to you, not a Hendrix track, actually. This is a Ray Charles track. Why, why uh, does, he, does he mean a lot to you? Was he a great influence? Oh, very much so. I mean, I think, I think with most people, I mean, Ray Charles is probably one of the first things I heard as an English player. You know, it was so difficult to get American imports at that time. Mm. Ray Charles, you know, a biggie of all time. And for Hendrix as well. Was he? Yeah, very a, much so. A big influence, yeah. right. Well, this is Night Time is the Right Time. Ray Charles, Night Time is the Right Time. My guest is Mitch Mitchell. We've got lots of calls for you, Mitch. And first of all, on the line, we've got Hamish and Epsom. Hello, Hamish. Hello there. Hello, what would you like to say to Mitch? Um, Mitch, I was reading an article recently in which you were going on about Jimmy's legendary appetite for the ladies. <laughs> <laughs> And there was one particularly disgraceful scene, I seem to remember, where, um, uh, you know, that he'd sort of go into his um, dressing room and there'd be a sort of whole bevy of lovelies sort of attending to his every need. Um, I just wondered, you know, was this a regular thing and what numbers were involved? <laughs> good, good question, Hamish. <laughs> Thank you, Hamish. Mm. Well, um, do you believe everything you read? I mean, you know, I mean, have you got pictures to prove this? Uh, no. The, on a serious vein here, you know, come on, you know, this is ridiculous. I mean... Christ, you know, before you're doing a concert, I mean, Bevis to attend to his every need. I mean, I, I've seen some of this stuff. Yes, there was someone doing his fingernails, another one of the toenails. Yeah. I mean, you know. Is it all load of blow? Come you? on. Yeah. You know, oh, really. Well, I know you musicians. You, you know, you like oh, do you? Pumpy Pumpy. Well, <laughs> Well, don't, I, a man's got to have a hobby. What can I say, Hamish? You know? I think you're envious, Hamish. Are you a musician yourself? Um, no, I'm not, but... Um, You'd like you know, to be, though. I, I like the ladies, yeah. I like the ladies. But, I mean, the thing is, um, obviously, you know, rock and roll scene, drink, women, all that sort of thing. I mean, after the gig, obviously, you know, you like to unwind and stuff. And um, from what I've read, especially in the 60s, it was, it was, thank you very much, how's your father? Yeah. Well, uh, unwinding after a gig, I don't think will be done in the dressing room, do you? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> Hamish... In the 60s, hold on a minute, Anne. In the 60s, OK, um, I mean, it, it was a lot more free and easy, wasn't it? And the atmosphere changed a lot in the 70s and 80s. Yes, I mean, very is, true. Is, is it the case now that musicians in the 80s are a lot more clean living, do you think? Well, we're in the 90s, actually, Hamish. In case I noticed it. <laughs> 1990, yeah. Remember? Yeah. Well, I, 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 can you answer that question? <laughs> no, with great difficulty, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, maybe we have some, uh, somebody else who'll be able to be an authority on this matter, Hamish. Call Go us. to a gig and maybe check out the dressing rooms, you know. Yeah. You can be the judge of it for yourself. Well, Get I'll yourself the backstage pass, Hamish, and see what happens. Definitely. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Hamish. Thank you, what a, what a oh. <laughs> Anyway, thank you very much for your call, Hamish. Now we've got Bill in Tottenham. Hello, Bill. Oh, hello. What would you like to say? Oh, hello, Mitch. Um, I'd like to hello. ask a question about the uh, uh, Crash Landing album, where it, I heard that um, the, uh, the backing tracks have been rubbed out and all these other musicians have been put on instead. Who, who took the decision to do that and uh, do the original tapes still exist? Uh, very good point. I would hope the original tapes still exist. Um, it was the decision of Alan Douglas who came in to work via the Hendrix estate uh, these people, when Hendrix died and uh, Mike Jeffrey, the manager, died, more or less took over everything and uh, decided in their infinite wisdom that, uh, you know, A, they'd have to pay Noel and myself, or actually Billy Cox and myself, and um, no, you know, so we got erased and uh, they chose to put on who they want to. Hmm. Um, you must have been very, very angry about that, weren't you? Yes, Mitch? I was, yeah. uh, to put it quite 
quite mildly. Yeah. I don't think Hendrix would have chosen things to be that way, mm. and but we, didn't, we had no say so in. Uh, Yes, it all got very nasty afterwards, didn't it, in terms of the estate and, and, I mean, you you ended up... Well, the the usual legal wrangles that go on. um, Yeah, I mean, you you did not become a very rich man as a result of it, did you? Not at that time through uh, through those tapes, especially. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and also, does um, Mitch think that uh, if Jimi Hendrix hadn't died, a lot of the stuff that's out now, would it have not been released? Yeah, I, I, I really feel a lot, a lot would not have been released. Um, you know, quality control was the one thing that he really cared for. And that's why he'd spend so much time in the studio. I think there's much too much product that's gone on the market that he wouldn't really have really? Uh, allowed. What sort of inferior stuff? Yeah, yeah. Mm. but let the public decide, you oh. know. Yeah. Well, that's By just... saying that, there's, there's quite a few bootlegs out there, which I'm... <laughs> I was not in favour of, but hearing some of the quality of the bootlegs, I feel to be superior to some of the product that's you know actually really? been released. Yeah. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Bill, thank you very much for your call. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Now Goodbye, we're going Bill. to bye. Now we're going to Chris in Wandsworth. Hello, Chris. Hello. Hello. What would you like to say? Hello. Um, I just like to ask a little trivia question. I was listening to Axis Boulder's Love, and I was listening to the first track, and I wondered if you can tell me who, um, if Mitch could tell me, who it was who did the the radio announcer's voice on EXP. Ah, yeah, I did. You did? Yeah. <laughs> I'll ask you a question. Yeah, we, we dealt with um, speeding up and slowing down the, the tape yeah. on that. Yeah, but that's, that's me doing my, my best BBC. It was, yeah. <laughs> oh, there's a, that is a terrific <laughs> trivia question, Good isn't question it? Good question, there. idea was it for the EXP, EXP track? Oh, that one. Uh, that, that was Jimmy's. Did, and did she write um, the words that you spoke as well? No, no, I, I did that. I, I did the format of oh, that. I see. Okay. Yes, because I, like, I think Axis Boulders loves his best album, and you know, whenever they talk about essential Jimi Hendrix, it's always they tend to leave Axis Boulders love, and I don't know why. Why do you think that is? Difficult to say. Probably because it's, it's early days. It's pretty raw, and um, you know, mm. it's, it's gut feeling at that time. I mean, for us to go into the studio was really quite a, a luxury. A luxury. Yeah. Um, in actual fact, we've just come across some tapes from that period of time that we're hoping will see the light of day. Yeah. And it would be very easy to uh, adulterate them and tart them up. We've gone now, uh, come on, they should go out to warts and all. Yeah. You know, so watch this space, you know. Really? So is there very much un- unreleased Hendrix material? Uh, Still? I don't know what the estate of Hendrix have available. We have very little, mm. but mm. I think it's very valid material. Oh, so I think, think, fingers crossed. I think people would want to hear it. Anyway, I'm, obviously you would, wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you for your call. If you want to talk to Mitchell Mitchell, the number to call is 071224 Now we're going to Tony in South East London. Hello, Tony. Hi, Anne. Hello, right. What would you like to say to Mitch? Hi, Mitch. Hi. Mitch, uh, just a, a question here. Jimi Hendrix was obviously left-handed, um, but he played a conventional right-handed Fender Strat, which was strung upside down. Why was that? Because it felt comfortable, in a word. Um, he could reach the controls. In a, in a better way. Yeah. And also, he had access, especially with a Fender Stratocaster, it was better, he got more leverage on the vibrato, on the tremolo arm, mm. by putting it upside it down. Upside down. But what, you about, know? what about the chord shapes? I mean, you know, when he's playing sort of blocks chords. Cool. Do you know what, well, the thing is with, with Hendrix, you know, call him ambidextrous, amphibious, you know, whatever you like, really, it made very little difference to him with, um, how a guitar was strung. In actual fact, he played right-handed bass a lot better than left-handed. Really? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just one of those quirks of nature, really. Oh, can you eat your eye out? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> are you, um, you a guitarist, Tony? I'm a bass guitarist, yeah. Bass is, oh, so you have yeah. a particular interest in this, obviously. Yeah, I just want to, I mean, I was, at, I was at the Isle of Wight when, uh, 20 years ago, I actually went to see Joe Cocker's Grease Band. Um, but just a, a last thing before I go, what actually you and uh, Noel Redding doing just now? I don't know, I believe Noel is living in Southern Ireland. Um, I'm back in the country for a short time, just working, publicising, working on the book. And then I'm off to America again, and uh, I'm working on some tracks at the moment. You're not drumming anymore, so... Oh, yeah. About. Damn right I am. Yeah, <laughs> actually, I'm just having a new kit made. So. Keep it up. Damn right. Thank you very He's much. still playing. Tony, Keep thanks. Thank Bye. you very much for your call. Bye. 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 I was at the Isle of Wight, too. Um, and John in Marland. Hello. 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 What would you like to say to Mitch? Well, can I just ask you one trivia question first? Yes. I've got, I've got a copy of a magazine here in front of me that says that Isle of Wight was the very last live performance Jimi Hendrix ever made. It, it wasn't, no. was it? Because he went to Sweden or something. That's after right. That. I'll be writing to the NME about that, because that's in the crossword, and that's a mistake. Good Ooh. man. There were, there were three gigs after, after the Isle of Wight. All right. No, I thought that was true. Anyway. Two in Sweden, one in Germany. When was, where was the very last one? Then? Um, Copenhagen. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, right, yeah, but the other thing I wanted to say was um, I got into Hendrix very much, you know, maybe about uh, five, six years ago, and I got I got pissed off very quickly, I got, I got annoyed very quickly, rather, <laughs> um, with, the, the, with, like you're saying, there's a lot of recordings out there and a lot of them aren't very good, but it's not just the quality. To me, I would say that he actually, he did play quite a few bad gigs. I mean, I really worship the guy, but fair enough, that there were some nights when he really wasn't that good, and a lot of it is crept onto tape, as you say, with bootlegs and other people's recordings would you say that was a fair assessment of course you know i mean everyone has good gigs bad gigs i mean for, for me the only time that uh you know hendrix would do less than required was if, if there were equipment problems yeah. you know basically and but and of course you know that would, that would annoy anyone you know if you've got radio channels like feeding through whatever the deal I, is I you know that, that would annoy the isle of Wight as yeah. well I, the, listening to that i feel just personally you know having heard a lot of his stuff that Isle of Wight, he sounds as if he's annoyed it to me it's not a good gig at all though it's supposed to be so famous and you're darn right film of it very soon I, you I didn't, it was a terrible gig well i actually quickly. missed it because i'd gone kind of sleep you actually didn't go you on till five sleep. in the morning did you no it was quite late you know and i'm right. one of the greatest regrets ever is that i actually um missed that opportunity Danny, do you seriously expect us to believe you were asleep well, I was actually living off the site. Oh, well, that's all right. I've um, got a cottage in the Isle of Wight, if it's not oh. too dear. <laughs> and so we were being a bit posh at those, on those days and, and actually had stayed up to see, I think the Who went on about yeah. one o'clock and it was pretty cold. And I don't think anyone realised that he was at, you, you were going to all play at five in the morning. And I think perhaps other mm -hmm. people... No, if I'd been on the site, John, of course I would have, wouldn't have gone to sleep, but I was, I was living off the site, that was why. And it's one of the greatest oh. regrets of my life. Um, did, does Mitch know anything about this, uh, the, the film of Isle of Wight that's on at the end Ah, of the I was just going to ask you about that, because isn't this is going to be released, or it's go there's going to be showings of it? Well, so I understand. I, I, I can't comment on it. I, I haven't seen the footage, and but, uh, you know, to, to go by what I've heard of the soundtrack, it leaves something to be desired. Yeah, yeah but, you know, John, I, I've read something very recently that it is going to be shown somewhere. Not the whole film, but just the Hendrix footage. It, I think it's the, there's a rock cinema series at the NFT. I that's it, that's it, you're that. right. That's yes, it me. is that. I'm mm. not, not going to bother to go and see it, if you oh. see what I mean, because I don't think I'd enjoy it that much. Yeah. Probably a smart move. OK, okay. anyway, I have to leave it there, because we've got some more calls to take, and we have Jan in Ealing. Hello, Jan. Oh. Hello. Oh, hello. Fine, far Hi. away. Uh... Yes, I'd like to speak to Mitch. You, yeah, you, you're through to him right now. Am I all right? Mm. Hi, Mitch. Uh, Hi, Jim. My name is Jan Olison. I used to be a photographer in the 60s, and uh, I took quite a few uh, lovely pictures of uh, yourself and uh, Jimmy. And I must say, in the beginning, you said what a lovely guy he was, which I totally agree with. And um, I was going to ask you, but somebody did be, uh, before uh, on the other call, uh, what Noel was doing, because the last time I saw him was in Houston uh, recording something in Cajun uh, Studios in uh, Houston, and nothing has been heard of him. What did you say? Well, to answer your question, I mean, Noel, as I understand, lives in Southern Ireland, and he does his little gigs over there with his the local band. Um, I, I know nothing really about these... Right. You know, studio sessions in England at all. Right. I mean, he's lived there for 20 years now, so... Uh, yeah. Sorry, can't help you. What are you, you going to do with the pictures, Jan? No, I've got... Uh, you know, I have uh, pictures of uh, more or less everybody from the 60s. You know, I'm still a photographer, so it's, it's, it's a continuing uh, situation. Yeah, well... Um, I mean, it's so historic, and it was a fantastic time in the 60s. It was, yeah. And uh, I love it. OK, can we leave it there, because I want to take another sure. call. Thank you very much. Thank now you, we've got Bill in Ballam. Hello, Bill. Hello, Amy. Hello, what would you like to say? Um, hello, yeah. Hi, Mitch. Hi, hi Bill. Hi, mate. Um, yeah, I, I apologise in advance for this question, because it might sound a bit tacky. Um, Go for it. Far away. I've often uh, wondered about Jimmy and, and drugs and stuff. Um, I mean, towards the end, um, you, you tend to hear people saying that he was completely into it and it was ruining him. I mean, what, yeah, what's, what's the story? The, what's the story, right? Uh, well, let's put, if a person was going to take as many drugs as, as, you know, Jimmy was supposed to, I mean, he wouldn't be able to uh, do any work at all, you know. I mean, this is one thing I try to dispel some of the rumours in, in my book, you know. I mean, we're not talking about, you know, some drug-ridden character here, like, all the time. Uh -huh. I mean, you know, I'm sure there were occasions, you know, um, but we're talking sort of recreation more than a way Did of life. Did you say he wasn't an addict? That's damn right. right. Never. Is that Sorry, what right. you want? Not, not at all. And we're, we're, we're not, never been talking about sort of anything heavyweight. Right, yeah. I yeah. mean, I've, I've just heard, you know, people saying, oh, he was into this, he was into this. You know, is, is that completely sort of ru ruled his life? No, I mean, people always like to uh, make out. That, that's part of the myth that goes within quite a few sort of, you know, 
unfortunately dead rock yeah. people. But he did die of an overdose, though. No, he didn't. He, he choked on his own yeah. vomit. I mean, like the autopsy yes. shows, you know, the that he had actual it in facts, his... but very little, yeah. you know, in his system, and nothing of any great heavyweight requirements. You know, it's just one of those quirks of nature, an accident, was, and being in the yeah. wrong place at the wrong time. I, know, I mean, I knew that he choked on his own vomit, but yeah. I assumed that was, because, that was a, a result of o ODing. No, no. Really? Mm -hmm. Well, Bill, I hope that answers your question. It Probably does. makes you feel a bit better about it him. It does, Good. actually. Thanks well, very much. Well, thank you very much. That's all. OK, well, well I think... Uh, Ooh, oh. Well, that's a, a good question to answer. Now, we've got one, time for one more record, um, Mitch, which is um, one of your old favourites. Harlem Shuffle, one of those absolute classics. Well, uh, we've run out of time now. Um, thank you, Mitch Mitchell. Thank you, Thank Annie. you very much indeed. And your book is called The Hendrix Experience, published by Hamlin at £14.95. I'd also like to thank my wonderful production team, Colin, Joe and Adrian. <laughs> Gary Crowley's fab show coming up next. On my show next Sunday, John Haylett, Deputy Editor of The Morning Star. Should be very interesting. And I'm sitting in for Trevor Dan tomorrow morning and all this week, so I'll see you at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning on GLR. And thanks for listening. Take care. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. It's 2 o'clock. <laughs>